Hi guys, and welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about how to diagnose hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. This includes hydrogen sulfide SIBO, but we're also gonna be talking about hydrogen sulfide overgrowth in the colon as well. That's why I specifically did not write the word SIBO here. Just think of this as hydrogen sulfide, wherever it is in the tube, we're gonna talk about how to diagnose it in this video. All right, let's start this video off by talking about breath testing. Now, probably this is what the majority of you at home have tried. This is what you're really interested in watching this video. And I do have a couple of things to say about this, but first I need to prime the newbies on why we would do a breath test for SIBO. Like what is the rationale for connecting something that you're breathing out of your mouth versus something that's in the tube somewhere in your abdomen. So the idea with SIBO is that you would have an overgrowth of bacteria, whereas normally you have a lot of bacteria in your colon, AKA the large intestine, but you don't have quite as many in the small bowel. And if you do, they're not from the same families or phyla that the others would be down here in the colon. But the idea with SIBO is that somewhere along this tube, you have a pocket or an overgrowth of bacteria that is more than you would expect. And also it looks more similar to that of the colon. Now I have other videos and podcasts dissecting why that might not actually be the source of your symptoms if you have SIBO, but that's a conversation for another day. And the idea is you would ingest a sugar substrate, usually either glucose or lactulose. It would move its way down your esophagus to your stomach and move its way through the small bowel. And then whenever it comes in contact with the bacteria, whether it be in the small bowel or your colon, that gas, let's say in this case it is, sorry, that's a, probably an obnoxious noise because my mic is right here. Um, let's say in this case it's hydrogen sulfide that gas is going to diffuse across the gut membrane, get into the nearby blood vessels, make its way through the blood vessels to your lungs, and then your lungs are going to exhale the hydrogen sulfide out your mouth, out of your breath. So that's the basic kind of mechanics and the methodology behind breath testing. Whether or not it's as accurate as we seem to think it is, very much up for grabs. Again, that's a topic for another day, but that's the basic gist of it. So when we're diagnosing SIBO specifically, we're looking for an abnormal rise in gases earlier than you would expect the substrate to hit the colon. So for example, if you saw a spike on a, on a, a breath test, for example, and it was three hours after you ingested the sugar, you could reasonably deduce that that was just hitting your colon and the microbiome that lives there. And it probably was well past your small intestine by that point. Similarly, if you had a spike in breath gases and it was say at the 20 minute mark, you might start thinking that the SIBO or the organisms are up here in the upper part of the small bowel and there's no way that they could have made it all the way down to your colon in that amount of time, right? So that's the two extreme ends are more uh, easily discernible, but the middle is where we have a lot of disagreement even between European and American guidelines. European guidelines tend to settle more with like the 60 minute mark American guidelines still settle with the 90 minute mark. So that's, again, there's a whole other conversation for breath testing at large, but this is the deal. So now in the American market, as of maybe about two years ago, we do have a breath test that looks for hydrogen sulfide specifically called TrioSmart. So this is the company that was, uh, it's either founded by or heavily influenced by Dr. Pimentel's work uh, and Cedar sinai it is a great test. I've been using this test since it became available. I was actually like really, really stoked when it came out. However, the problem I have with Trio Smart, which I mentioned in a totally separate video a year or two ago, is that I think that the way it's being interpreted oftentimes is incorrect. And yes, I realize that this actually goes against what Dr. Pimentel says himself, but I have seen people, including Pimentel, talk about how if if hydrogen sulfide is elevated, no matter where it is, even if it's a baseline elevation, oh my gosh, it's hydrogen sulfide SIBO. I disagree with that and here's why. The whole point of doing the breath test is for the timing of the test. If we wanted to just get a baseline measurement of gases being produced from the entire body and the entire GI tract, then we would just do a single sample, but we don't, we don't do that. I mean, that is becoming more of a thing for methane, but again, different topic for another day. But what we're doing is we're looking for the peak to occur in a time frame that we can assume is coming from this section of the tube. If it's too early, 
we're thinking upper part of the GI tract. If it's coming too late, we're thinking it's from the colon and therefore it wouldn't be labeled as SIBO. Now you could treat hydrogen sulfide overgrowth largely the same way in either location, in my experience anyway. So maybe it's a misnomer, but I see a lot of people who are told or who assume that they have hydrogen sulfide SIBO and they don't, they have a baseline elevation of these gases. And again, the thing is, if you're measuring based on baseline, let's use red for hydrogen sulfide again, that hydrogen sulfide gas could be going into your bloodstream and out your lungs through the colon. That's the most likely. It could be coming from the small bowel. That is a possibility, but we have no way of differentiating between the two. Heck, it could be coming from hydrogen sulfide overgrowth in the stomach, the esophagus, the urinary system. It could be coming from your mouth, which I'll mention in a minute. The point is, if we're just getting a single snapshot and we're ignoring the time frame piece of it, we cannot call it SIBO. We can say it's hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. We can call it hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis we cannot call it hydrogen sulfide SIBO. So if you're looking for that granular of a diagnosis, you've got to go with a change in hydrogen sulfide production from baseline. If you start out with an elevated baseline, you could deduce that you have hydrogen sulfide production, but you don't know where it's from. So that's my biggest, my biggest um, beef, if you will, with the TRIO SMART test. It's a great test. I just think that it's being misused 95% of the time. And part of that is because of what Dr. Pimentel himself has said about the test. So I think that the way that we're using it is a bit flawed. That being said, there's also this idea out there of a flatline test. So for example, say that you went to your GI doctor or your naturopath and they don't know about Trio Smart, or they know about it, but they're not ordering it. And they just give you the standard hydrogen or hydrogen methane SIBO test or say you're in another country and you can't get the TRIO SMART test because you're not here in the United States, what do you do then? And one of the things that I've seen on the internet over the years, let's see, do I have room to draw this? One of the things that I've seen is this idea that, all right, this is time and this is gas. What typically is talked about for like a slam dunk positive SIBO diagnosis, which again, this is up for debate a little bit, believe it or not, is the double peak. So the idea that you get a peak and then another peak as time goes on. And what is said is that the first peak is the, ga the gas being produced in the small bowel and the second peak is the colon. Um, there is this, this thought out there. Again, I don't know how accurate it is. Um, I've seen it floating around for years, but there's this idea that if you have no hydrogen production or very, very little, and they call it a flat line test, that that is because the hydrogen sulfide producers are gobbling up the hydrogen and they're stealing it, sequestering it to make hydrogen sulfide. But because this test does not measure hydrogen sulfide directly, you are missing it, right? So like the hydrogen that is being produced is being gobbled up before it can be exhaled in the breath. But if you were to measure hydrogen sulfide, you would see that it's there. I haven't seen any papers that indicate that this is in actuality happening. I know uh, Lucy Mailing has a really great mini course about hydrogen sulfide and she mentioned a paper where they looked at this and I forget what it was, but basically like half of the people that they found who breathed out hydrogen sulfide, half of those people also breathed out hydrogen. Um, I read the entire paper today and I cannot find those numbers and I cannot find any mention of, of that whatsoever in the paper. So I don't know if she contacted the principal investigator and got like more of the data behind the scenes or where she's getting that from. But I read that paper and I could not find that anywhere in the paper and it was kind of driving me bonkers. So I, I went through and read a lot of it twice. Um, but according to that, from what she had said in her class is that that kind of disproves the hypothesis somewhat that the idea here is that you wouldn't be exhaling hydrogen because it's all getting gobbled up and sequestered. But they were showing that about 50% of the people who do have hydrogen sulfide on a breath test also are exhaling hydrogen. So I don't, I don't know, make, make of that what you will. I think that it's interesting. I just don't know where she got that data from. But aside from that one thing that she mentioned, I have yet to see this study, the idea of a flatline test. Um, I mean, a flatline test could also just be a negative test. It could be that you have really slow transit time too, right? Like if you're only measuring the breath 
for two to three hours. Most labs are doing two, but occasionally you see three. Maybe it takes you four hours to get that sugar substrate down to your colon where you would see the peak. So there's a couple of different scenarios that I could see playing into that, but I personally don't by the flat line equals hydrogen sulfide thing, not a, not 100% of the time at least. I think that there are a couple of possibilities there and you need to kind of suss them out for the individual person. The other thing I wanted to mention, which I alluded to here, one of the problems with breath testing, and this will include hydrogen sulfide I think, is again this idea that the baseline level of hydrogen sulfide that you're producing could be coming from anywhere in the GI tract or otherwise. Heck, your ovaries could be producing hydrogen sulfide for all we know. We don't know. That's the point. We just don't know where it's coming from, which is why I'm not comfortable calling it hydrogen sulfide SIBO. But there was a really interesting paper. Um, Dr. Haralek, the probiotic advisor guy, was one of the investigators on this paper. I believe it was 2020. I'm gonna link that down below. And I'll link the, the paper that Lucy Mailing mentioned as well so that you can check that out. Maybe I missed it. Um, but what they were showing is when they had people using a mouthwash, an antibacterial mouthwash, prior to collection of the breath samples, it pretty drastically changed the results of the breath samples to a point where they, there were a lot of people, I forget the numbers exactly, but there were a fair amount of people who met diagnostic criteria for SIBO if they did not use the mouthwash but once they used the mouthwash and they decontaminated their oral cavity prior to breathing into the tube or the bag or whatever, a lot of those people then did not meet diagnostic criteria for SIBO, meaning that they would have gotten a false positive on a SIBO breath test had their funky microbiome in their mouth not been addressed. And they even did some testing where they did just a oral rinse, an antimicrobial oral rinse prior to the first sample and then they didn't do it for the rest of the test. And then another group of people, they did a oral rinse at every single sample. And what seems to be the most accurate is that you would do an, an antimicrobial antibiotic mouth rinse before each and every sample of the breath test. And that's probably going to yield the clearest results. But going back to this point, not only can the baseline value be affected by other parts of your body other than the small bowel, but each and every sample along the way could potentially be influenced by the organisms that live in your mouth. If you think about like our breath has a smell to it, particularly if you have dysbiosis in the mouth, that, that load of bacteria in your mouth is also producing gas. And we're measuring the breath as it comes out of the mouth. And the breath had to go through the trachea and the pharynx and the mouth to get into that tube. So keep that in mind as well is that hydrogen sulfide might be getting overdosed based on breath testing along with methane and hydrogen. Methane particularly in this study was really affected by this, but it could be that this is going to be overdiagnosed with people using this new TRIO smart test because you're getting a lot of hydrogen sulfide production and exhalation at the, the oral microbiome level and you're not even aware of that. Now, finally, let's get to stool testing because I know that this is something that comes up a lot. Probably a lot of you have done some sort of stool testing. Maybe you have watched videos on my channel about how to interpret those tests. So let's get into that. But first, I do want to point out something that I've covered in a prior video, which I will try to remember to link for you, that you cannot diagnose SIBO based on stool testing. You can't. I don't care what Vibrant America Gut Zoomer tells you. I don't care what you know, Biome FX or the GI map or your functional doctor or your naturopath tell you they are wrong. You cannot diagnose this with a stool sample. You know how I know because the ecosystems look entirely different. Like we've studied this now a couple of times, but most notably more recently, I think in 2020, it was Dr. Pimentel's group again with the reimagined study and they took samples of the microbiome and the communities along the small bowel, the colon, and then they compared it to stool testing and they were nothing alike. So if you're doing stool testing, it's a fantastic tool. I, I use stool testing a lot with my patients, don't get me wrong, but just know if you're trying to gather information from here, it's probably gonna yield very limited or very skewed results, but it'll probably tell you, I mean, honestly, at best, stool testing is gonna tell you what's going on from here to here. 
even if you look at the microbial, uh, microbial profile of the proximal or the beginning part of the colon versus the distal or the end part of the colon, there's some differences even along that part of the tube. So best case, with, with the highest degree of accuracy, I could say stool testing is telling you what's happening from here to here. Maybe, maybe it can tell you what's happening in the colon at large. It's still a great tool. It's just gonna be flawed, particularly if you're thinking that you're gonna gather information from here. You just, you can't. But that being said, what I have seen is hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis showing up on stool testing. And there's a couple of different flavors that I've seen of this. Um, there are a few, maybe I don't need to hold these the whole time. There are a few bacteria that we know for sure make hydrogen sulfide and they make it in copious amounts. And there are a lot of other bacteria that we think produce hydrogen sulfide, but it's a little bit more questionable and they haven't been studied for that purpose nearly as much. In the, we know for sure they're hydrogen sulfide producers category, we have two. We've got Bilophila, Bilophila wadsworthia, and Desulfo vibrio, particularly Desulfo vibrio piger, but I believe there's another one in that, that genre that will do it too. If you see an overgrowth of Bilophila or Desulfo vibrio on stool testing, in my opinion, you can deduce that you have hydrogen sulfide overgrowth in the colon and that is worthy of your attention. That is worthy of treating more than likely because you don't want too much of this stuff hanging around. Hydrogen sulfide is really, really important and physiologically good at low levels, but if it gets too high, it can cause a lot of problems. So if you see this on like an ombre test, one of the old like Ubiome style tests, like 16S, I believe BiomeFX includes one or both of these. Um, they are not on the GI map. I believe Desulfo Vibrio is on the GI effects from Genova, but Bilophila is not currently. You get the idea. If you see one of these two names pop up on a stool test, I do think it's worthy of your attention. The other ones that I see mentioned, and this honestly, this comes from the functional space a lot of the time, is I'll see well-intentioned providers tell their patients, or I've, I've seen this in like Facebook groups as well. I've seen people say, oh, you have a Pseudomonas overgrowth a Klebsiella overgrowth, Citrobacter, E. coli, like all of these big names in the proteobacteria phylum. And they'll say, oh my God, they're hydrogen sulfide producers. Therefore you have hydrogen sulfide SIBO. And I would say not necessarily, like we do have a little bit of evidence pointing to some of those guys like E. coli, um, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Um, I think even, oh, why is, why is one, Proteus. Uh, Citrobacter, we do have evidence that those guys probably make hydrogen sulfide, but it's most likely in lower amounts than the two that I mentioned before. So if you get, for example, a GI map, or if you get a Genova GI effects, or if you get a, a, another type of microbial analysis done, and you have an overgrowth of one of those, I would still address it more than likely, but I don't know if I would go running with the diagnosis of hydrogen sulfide overgrowth or think that that is the biggest piece of the puzzle for you. I think, I would say in that case, it's probable, but we're not super sure about it at this time. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily target 100% of the treatment to hydrogen sulfide if you were in that scenario. Um, Cause again, we just, we don't know. The two that really show up in the bulk of microbiome research are again, Desulfo Vibrio and Bilophila. If you see those, definitely start thinking hydrogen sulfide overgrowth and treating it appropriately. If you see some of those other ones I rattled off, like Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, E. coli, you could think maybe they're producing hydrogen sulfide. You still wanna get rid of them if they're overgrown. They're not really great to have in an abundance, but I don't know if I would start falling all the way down the rabbit hole of hydrogen sulfide if that was your only evidence to go off of. As always, thank you so much for watching, guys. This is going to be the beginning of a series on hydrogen sulfide. So let me know your hydrogen sulfide comments and questions down below in the comments. I am going to be looking at those before I start filming the next batch of videos for this topic. We're gonna to talk about the most appropriate diet to use for hydrogen sulfide overgrowth, the best herbal antimicrobials and strategies that you could use to treat it. But I'm also open to making other videos if you have particular questions or if there's a recurring theme in the comment section about hydrogen sulfide. I'm also kind of tempted to make a video about the specific symptoms 
of hydrogen sulfide overgrowth, but I don't know if you would actually want to watch that. Just let me know if that's something you want me to do because I'm kind of on the fence. Part of me is thinking, well, you could probably Google symptoms of hydrogen sulfide overgrowth. I don't know if that's super important to you, but if you want, I can go into detail about some of the symptoms and some of the physiology of hydrogen sulfide overgrowth that you might be interested in. And it could help piece together some of this, this craziness in your head as to why you're feeling the way you are. So let me know what you want to see in this mini series that I'm doing on hydrogen sulfide this summer. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Hey guys, if you like this video, be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, click the like button, and leave a comment down below with the videos that you would like to see me do next. Doing all of those really helps support the channel and support my efforts in making as many videos as possible for you guys. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in the next video.